Hi, I'm Dr. By the Way. I'm a forensic anthropologist. And if you're not familiar with a forensic anthropologist, if you've seen the show Bones, that's a forensic anthropologist. If you've not seen the show Bones, a forensic anthropologist studies the human body and specifically the human skeleton. And then we apply that in real world scenarios. Forensic anthropology is both a natural science and an applied science. The applied part of it is we use the data we collect from the skeleton and we use that to aid law enforcement to solve crimes. We use a lot of techniques, a lot of uh, techniques that you may be familiar with. Engineering techniques, we use a lot of equations in math to analyze and come up with a scenario of what this crime might have been. There are two main functions of a forensic anthropologist. One is working in the field, as we're doing here, a search and recovery. The second is working in the lab. What's the process out here in the field? Well, we have our equipment. We have a screen because we may need to screen, dig down in the dirt. We use our trowels here. We dig down in the dirt to see if there's any bones in there that we're missing and then we screen them on this screen here. But do you think we can just collect these bones and go to the lab? No, we have to do some very systematic work, methodical work before we can do that. When, you're, when you have a crime scene like this and you are going to remove the skeletal remains, it may be a year before this case goes to trial and the jurors may want to come out to the crime scene and if they do, they need to know exactly where that individual was. And so what we first want to do is get a GPS reading. Now, sometimes you can't get a GPS reading because of the foliage and you're not able to get it. In that case, what you're going to need to do and what you should have in your field kit is a compass. So you're going to use a compass, you're going to find north, and you can see, if you can see in the back, I already have the north arrow set up. But you're also going to, to use measuring tapes to get the exact location of this individual. Along with making sure you have the exact location of this individual you're going to need to map this individual and why do you think we're going to map the position of this person well once this person's picked up if we did not record the exact position that body was in we won't know how what was the behavior of the criminal at the time is the individual on their stomach are they on their back? Do we see drag marks? Are they on their side? So we want to record that. So we're going to map this skeleton in the exact position that it's in. In addition to mapping, we also are going to photograph this individual. Once we do all of that, we can start picking up the bones systematically, putting, in, putting them in evidence bags, with their provenience tags so we know exactly where they were and we're going to take that to the lab. Now if we look at the skeleton here, it's a surface, we would call it a surface remains and what do you notice about it? Well, the bones are pretty white so we know that this individual has not been buried but actually has been on the surface and been exposed to the sun and that's why their bones are so white. Now, there is some leaf debris over the skeleton, but that's usually caused by a season. We know that a season has gone by and leaves have dropped, um, and so that's why we see that little bit on the, on the remains. When I was young, probably your age, I really loved being outside and digging for dinosaur bones and looking for Native American Indian arrowheads. I really loved that. But you know, life's pathways take you in different directions and you have to be practical at times. And I needed a job. I wanted a car, so I had to work. But I volunteered at an archeological site and I had a great mentor there. Her name was Miss Warren. Miss Warren was an archaeologist. She was a supervisor there. And at this site, we came across Indian burials. 
and I was really hooked when we started recovering some of those burials. And she saw my enthusiasm and she encouraged me to go to college and do it as a career. And here I am today. The best part of my job is field work. I really enjoy being out in the field. And I, it's in a simplistic way, Recovering a skeleton like this is like a treasure hunt because you need to find every single bone and you need to find any other evidence that might be associated with this case. So it's like a treasure hunt in a simplistic way. Another thing about this kind of field work that's so enjoyable is you're actually helping a family. It's significant work. You found someone's loved one and it's gonna bring closure for them which is a great feeling. It's very satisfying and rewarding that you're really doing a job and it's an applied job in a very significant, significant way. We're gonna head into the lab. Come on, let's show you, I'll show you what, what's in the lab. Well, here we are in the lab. In the lab, we use a lot of different equipment and instruments to gather our data, such as, if, as you can see in the back here, where this femur is laying, this instrument here is called an osteometric board, where we measure the length of the long bone by putting this plate up against the bone. We can measure that long bone and estimate someone's stature. So we use instruments such as this. We use measuring instruments so we can measure the skull, we can measure the breadth of the skull, we can measure the length of the skull. We do a lot of measurements on the skull because it gives us a lot of information. And we also can use x-rays as you can see in this poster behind you. So the data that we're gathering is called the biological profile. The biological profile is the estimation of from skeletal remains, the sex of the individual, the age of the individual, the ancestry of the individual, and potentially using long bones, how tall the individual is. We also look for bone trauma. That's why we cut the skull open so we can look inside the skull because sometimes it's hard to see trauma from an x-ray. So we open, we open the skull to look for trauma there as well as all over the skeleton. We also look for bone pathologies and other things on the, on the skeleton, not just the skull, the whole skeleton that might be identifying features such as a medical apparatus that could absolutely identify this person. So we collect all that data, but why not just do DNA? Why don't we just do DNA? Well, if we have no one to match it with, a sister, brother, mother, father, this DNA may sit in the DNA database and never get identified. So to help law enforcement, we give them this biological profile, this information, and what's it gonna do? Well, it's going to narrow their list of missing persons. So for instance, what we brought in from the field, remember the skeleton that we had out in the field, when we examined this individual, took all those measurements using observation with our eyes, our experience, we find that this individual is of Asian ancestry. It's a female. She's between 30 and 40 years of age, and she is about 5'3 to 5'6 in her height. So is law enforcement going to look for a 20-year-old of European ancestry female? No. Are they going to look for a 50-year-old male of African ancestry? No. They're going to look for a Asian female in that range, maybe a little bit younger than 30, a little bit older than 40, but around that range. And this will narrow down their list of potential missing persons. And then from there, if they have a few individuals, they could do DNA. DNA takes a good bit of time and it's costly. So if you can whittle that down to a few individuals, that would be helpful. 
So that's what we do in the lab, the biological profile. And one other thing about this young gal here, we found that on the hip, she had a fracture. And the fracture on the hip happened around about the time of death. So the type of fracture it is looks like that she may have been struck by a vehicle. So all that information will help law enforcement. If you are interested in becoming a forensic anthropologist, you have to go to college. In your studies in high school, they most likely will not offer anthropology, but they probably will offer forensic science. So I would certainly take forensic science in high school. And if you can take advanced biology courses, that would be good as well. And while you're in high school, go ahead and start visiting some of these colleges. Start looking around at some of these colleges that have anthropology programs and specifically physical anthropology. Physical anthropology is absolutely the study of the human body. So, and a part of that, a shoot off of physical anthropology is forensic anthropology. So start looking for colleges. If you find some, go to those colleges, visit them, visit the professors, tell them your interests so they can connect your name with a face when you go to apply. You can just get a master's degree uh, and that will allow you to work in a forensic lab. It will allow you to work for a medical examiner's office. However, you will be under the tutelage of a forensic anthropologist that has a PhD. If you want to work independently, if you want to do casework, if you want to be able to go to uh, court and testify in court or to teach, you will need to get your doctorate degree, your PhD. Forensic anthropology in itself is a hard discipline physically because out in the field um, you may be out there in extreme heat you may be out there in extreme cold you may be on your belly digging in a burial and your neck's hurting and your back's hurting so there is some hard physical labor in forensic anthropology in the laboratory it's meticulous it's you have to have patience you have to be detail oriented um, but the forensic anthropology is so rewarding because you are helping solve a crime. You're helping return a loved one to their family and, and giving closure to the family. So it's a very rewarding career, but it is rigorous. It is. It does have some uh, some endurance that you need for forensic anthropology. And I just wish you your best in your academic endeavors and. Um, hoping you're having a good time in this STEM 2020 career day. Thanks so much.